Hi, Ed Roseman here, author of Edley's Music Theory for Practical People and Edley Paints the Ivories Blue. Edley's my nickname and my home on the web is edley.com. Some years ago, I was listening to Stravinsky's Soldier's Tale and thinking about the unusual ensemble for which it was written. Clarinet and bassoon, trumpet and trombone, violin and double bass, and percussion. As things would have it, I then heard the old Cracker Jack jingle and was struck by that piece's equally hodgepodgey ensemble. Singers, piccolo, bassoon, string bass, a xylophone cameo, and snare played with brushes. I decided I wanted to do a musical analysis of one of the pieces. But which one? The Soldier's Tale or Cracker Jack? Two very different pieces of chamber music, to say the least, both written for unusual ensembles. There are things to be learned from each, but one is a good bite-sized piece and still has plenty to teach. Although a much simpler musical vocabulary than Stravinsky, this jingle is nonetheless excellently written. I invite you to consider it from a compositional and orchestrational perspective to look more deeply into and learn from something you might have otherwise taken for granted. Cracker Jack always had a prize inside the box. To me, the real prize is the one outside the box, the jingle. I hope to show you why in this presentation and hopefully teach you a thing or two about music in the process. The jingle's in four sections. Let's give it a listen and then we'll go back and dissect it. What do you want when you gotta eat something? And it's gotta be sweet and it's gotta be a lot and you gotta have it now. What do you want? Lip smacking, whip smacking, patty whacking, ink and knacking, silver racking, scalpel racking, cracker jacking, cracker jack. Candy coated popcorn, peanuts and a prize. That's what you get in cracker jack. Here's the score, which I transcribed one day some years ago in a fit of whimsy, because I've always liked it, was intrigued by the construction and orchestration, and because I'm kind of nutty that way. By the way, I omitted the snare drum for my transcription. Let's break this one-page score into its component sections to make things easier to see. That's better. Here are the four sections. A two-bar instrumental intro followed by three longer sections, all of which lead up and build to the final section, which is the musical punchline and the advertising Big Bang. Right. Let's take a look at each section in turn, after which we'll put it all back together. Here's the intro, but before we start talking about the music itself, let's just go over some score reading basics. Piccolo always sounds an octave higher than written because, being such a high instrument, if it were written as it sounds, a whole lot of its notes would be way above the staff. Likewise, but in the opposite direction, bass always sounds an octave lower than written because it's so low. In this piece, the bass is pizzicato, meaning plucked, rather than bowed, throughout. This symbol means repeat the previous bar. Lastly, double bar lines mark the borders between sections, in this case, the end of this two-bar intro. Got all that? Okay, let's clean up a bit and talk about the music itself. The intro is light and playful from the get-go. A number of things contribute to setting the mood. First and foremost is the combination of the timbres, or tone colors, of the chirpy piccolo and the nasal, rather comical bassoon. Their playing the same melody three octaves apart also adds. Then there's the pick and bassoon's glisses, the triplet subdivision, and the use of chromatic lower neighbors, that is, notes from outside the key that are half-step below, chromatic lower neighbors. Okay, let's clean up the score again and give it a listen. That's the intro. Let's move on to the second section where the singer enters with a question and some clarifications of that question. The triplet subdivision continues and the accompaniment is relaxed, rambling, and sparse. Solo means one voice as opposed to several. We are asked what we want to eat. Then that's clarified in terms of flavor, quantity, and timing. How should it taste? Sweet. How much should there be? A lot. And when do you need it? Now. Flavor, quantity, and timing. Each clarification is a repetition of a four-beat musical phrase. Good use of repetition. The entire question is then insistently summarized on one repeated note, 
What do you want? Repetition builds anticipation of something being about to happen, and indeed something is. The question is about to be answered in the next section. But before moving on, let's dig a bit deeper into this section. Notice the melody's use of the same chromatic lower neighbors we saw in the intro in the piccolo and bassoon. Speaking of the pick and bassoon, why do you think they drop out at the beginning of this section? Their doing so creates space, a spotlight for the singer's entrance. The bassoon re-enters here just for texture. How would you describe the function of this riff and these staccato notes? Why are they there? Punctuation. The first riff is like a question mark following the long question, and the staccato notes at the very end are like a question mark for what do you want? So why does the bass drop out? To create space for, a spotlight on, the punctuation riff. Let's listen with all that in mind. What do you want when you gotta eat something? And it's gotta be sweet, and it's gotta be a lot, and you gotta have it now. What do you want? On to the third section, a whimsical answer to the question we were just posed. Now we're in a duple subdivision, meaning beats are divided in two instead of three. It's faster and more frenetic and accelerates from there. Tutti is Italian for everyone as opposed to solo. There are now several voices instead of just one. That and the fact that the bass is now doing double time both add to the more frenetic feeling. Right. In the previous section, the clarifications of the question, what do you want, flavor, quantity, and timing, were the basis of the musical repetition. In this section, a whimsical first part of the answer to that question, there's repetition too, and even more of it. This time, each musical repetition is a descriptive aspect of what we're being told we want. It's lip smacking. It's whip cracking. It's evidently also patty whacking, go figure, as well as a number of other things. Great use of repetition. Further, notice that what's being repeated are variants of the nya nya teasing riff every kid knows. Lastly, notice that the repetition is tighter every two beats as opposed to the previous section's four. The faster rate of repetition also definitely contributes to the increased frenetic feeling. Moving from composition to orchestration, the first two sections were relatively dry. There was just one singer, and there was no doubling or harmonizing of the vocals. Resonance, that is depth of sound, is upped starting in this section. Additional voices add excitement along with resonance, as does the pick and bassoons taking turns doubling the voices, the first instances of anything doing so. Then the bassoon harmonizes the melody, adding further resonance, and then adds a quick flourish for a bit more whimsy. Here are all the instances of resonance. There'll be more in the next section. Why do the pick and bassoon drop out here? To create space for the punctuating re-entry. Okay, I know that was a lot of information. Let's listen with all that in mind. Lip smackin', whip crackin', patty whackin', ink and knackin', silver rackin', shallow whackin', cracker jackin', boo, cracker jack. Maybe you noticed that the last bar of this section is missing two beats and a bar line. It has been all along. That's a byproduct of splitting up the score into sections. Let's return to the one-page version of the score to talk about it. We're looking at bar 13, shown here as a full 4-beat bar. You see, here, mid-bar, is where section 3 really ends and section 4 begins. The notes of the ascending phrase are called pickups. They lead into and belong musically to section 4, despite their appearing physically in the last bar of section 3. But don't take my word for it. Listen to a fragment of section 3 without the pickups. It sounds complete like the jingle could end right there. Cracker Jack and Boo! Cracker Jack! Now listen to a fragment of the same section with the pickups that actually belong to the next section. It sounds like it's interrupted mid-sentence. Cracker Jack and Boo! Cracker Jack! Nah. As an aside, and without going into detail, Music notation rules dictate that when the score is written continuously, the double bar stays where it is at the beginning of bar 14. It's understood that the pickups belong to the next section. Now let's look at all of section 4 with its pickups. 
Section 4 is an actual melody grown from the teasing riff rather than just being repetitions of it. The harmonized pickups create momentum and expectation. They're in parallel tenths, which adds resonance. Evidently, the orchestrator wanted lots of resonance in these last two sections. Sustained notes are an orchestrational equivalent of the piano sustain pedal. Resonance. There's yet more in the pick sustain note and in the bass and bassoon's parallel tenths. Here are all the examples of resonance in this section. Moving on, and away from resonance, why do the instruments drop out here? They do so to create a sense of incompleteness. Why would they do that, you might ask? How about this explanation? They drop out to let the melody finish, but to leave things feeling incomplete until they come back in with a 5-1 full cadence, G to C. Okay, let's give this section a listen with all that in mind. Candy-coated popcorn, peanuts, and a prize. That's what you get in Cracker Jack. There, we've looked at the four sections of this jingle. Let's listen to the whole thing one more time without any interruptions or on-screen help. Ready? Here we go. What do you want when you gotta eat something? And it's gotta be sweet, and it's gotta be a lot, and you gotta have it now. What do you want? Lip smack and whip, crack and patty whack and ink and knack and silver rack and scallop whack and cracker jack and boo, cracker jack. Candy-coated popcorn, peanuts and a prize. That's what you get in Cracker Jack. There you go. Great writing and very effective orchestration of an unusual and very small ensemble. Great use of tone color, repetition, punctuation, space, dryness, and resonance. Thanks for watching. I hope this presentation has helped you see farther into this prize of a jingle. If so, yay. If not, well, watch it again, or send me feedback on how I could have done better. Maybe we'll do Stravinsky another time. Or maybe something else. Stay tuned. If you like this, visit edley.com and check out my books.